Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 605. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 20th, 2020. All right. Before I reveal my secret location, I need you guys to like, share, subscribe, and comment on the program. You guys are the best commenters ever. I'm, I feel sorry for other YouTube channels where the commenters just don't hang around much and, and involve themselves, but you guys are really good, and we really appreciate that. We're moving up on the YouTube algorithms and the Facebook, and we're getting close to 6,000 subscribers. Now, a lot of you are like, you don't have a million subscribers yet? No, we don't have a million subscribers. We, uh, not, <laughs> we're not cutie pie. But uh, we, we appreciate the 6,000 of you who are out there who subscribe to the program. Okay. Not my normal background here, is it? I'm in the RV that we're renovating. We drove it off to Hers Hershey, Pennsylvania. We're going to visit my kids who live in Pittsburgh. And it's a great chance to take this uh, old bucket of bolts out. And uh, uh, we're going to paint the inside. We're rewiring some stuff. We're adding some lights. And we're making this old uh, machine look at least a, like it's from the last century so uh we're updating a few things in here and it's just a great opportunity and you're putting in, oh, what's that you're putting in enough electronics to help nasa track satellites i understand well as a matter of fact if uh, you'll you, have if, a dish on the top and <laughs> well right in the front i haven't put it on top yet uh can i get over there no that's the other way uh Beyond the uh, the captain's seat, there is a huge antenna that's connecting my iPhone to all the cell towers here. We arrived, and there's one bar here. That's not going to do. I, I need more than one bar for uh, connecting uh, Anglican TV services. So I've, I put my Wii Boost on, and I, I flick the switch. It's like the, the beginning of Back to the Future, where you hear the zzzz radiations permeating the windshield but i got five bars and george and i are communicating via uh cell phone here uh conducting and scripted i like it it'll do uh i'll be traveling a lot this summer jill and i uh, are taking some time off from work and uh working from the rv and we're going to do some traveling as things start to open up and we'll uh, i'll certainly videotape some of my adventures i don't know if i'm going to videotape the the rv renovating uh, that's sort of a how-to stuff and basically if I did that I would be putting together one of the best documentaries of how not to renovate an RV and I don't <laughs> maybe that has some some value or not George how you been doing in Florida Kevin, yeah. Kevin, well Kevin I, I do want to say you do have material for this show I did you tell me that you've learned the first lesson about RVing last night when you arrived at the, uh, at the oh camp. <laughs> sure complete newbie okay uh basically the rule is you don't want to drive more than six hours to a, a place you're going and you want to leave you want to be there by three so you can have time to set up and stuff like that so after a whole day of driving uh, across connecticut and pennsylvania we arrive at the uh this nice quiet place at 10 p.m so everybody hears this big, you know, Cummings diesel engine coming and they're looking out their tents and their their campers. Who who's coming here at ten a.m. And then what's dark? See, we can't find the campsite. We're driving around looking for it, looking for it. We pull up, and you know, a good fifty percent of people are just looking at at us, which is we are the only entertainment so we understand that and um hop out of the, the bus and plug everything in and put the slides out put the jacks down boom ready to go the show is over but total newbies we will not arrive at a campground again after dark it was it was silly to do um and it it disrupts the flow of the calmness of an rv park i know because this is my first visit <laughs> so that's me george how are you doing Pretty good. I've been exiled back into the office from the house. My daughter's uh, fled California. Uh, she's actually in the process of moving from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and she's got a few weeks before her new work starts up uh, up uh, San Francisco way. And so we've have her at home, and 
And my wife informed me that our daughter likes to rise sort of latish in the morning and walk around in her underwear and ask what's for breakfast. And having her on the background would be a little disconcerting to people. So get thee to the office. <laughs> Good. Also, I need to note you're not going to see my Vikings cup as I'm drinking coffee because in our haste to pack, I brought, well, I, I'm a 50 year old man, I have my CPAP. I have my prescriptions, my toothbrush, uh, a couple changes of shirt. I forgot the coffee maker. I'm here. What about the, the cat? Uh, we have an automatic feeder back at home. She doesn't care. We left her once for a week with this automatic feeder and automatic thing. We got back. She, oh, you're back. Uh, hey, don't you love us? You know. But so I, I left the coffee maker at home. So I, I'm looking at myself. My eyes are droopy. My nose is. Droopy. I just don't have no caffeine in me, George. It's it, it's hard, so um, I may not be as excited as I normally am when I have uh, five or six cups of coffee in me. Please forgive me, George. Should we move on to the news? You want to tell them about Chop? Well, my daughter is a twin. She and her sister are twins, and the wonderful thing is, all their lives they have tattled on each other to mommy and daddy. Claudia, my other daughter, lives in Seattle. And I have found that she and she is at working at home during the lockdown, which means that for the past week or so, she and her friends during the day go down to Chaz or Chop, whatever it's now called, the Autonomous Zone in Seattle. And, and they say it's like a street fair there, poetry readings and Stabbings. all this sort of... <laughs> no, no. It, it's funny. It, it's... Uh, hippie central in the daylight hours and then when the lights go down it's lord of the Fra flies crime and but one of the neat things is is that my children who are like most kids of their generation and whose minds have been warped by the education system and media about reality are getting lessons about unfettered capitalism uh in other words how does CHOP operate on sort of an egalitarian share and share alike process? No. <laughs> it is street market bazaar stuff. It is theft. It is uh, not, you know, to each, each according to the ability, each according to the need. No, it's my gun is bigger than your gun. Therefore, it's mine. Well, uh, I, I put the, the, uh, the free speech. There's no such thing as free speech if the mob disagrees with you. No, it, so it, their it, their illusions are being dis, dis, uh, rapidly turned aside about yeah. the uh, neatness the, of this experiment. This is the ultimate mob rule that you've ever seen. I, I posted a tweet on Facebook by one of the people who start Chaz, and he posts this tweet. Uh, for, I'm I'm sick and tired of this. I'm leaving. Um, I woke up this morning, I went and got some coffee, I came back, my laptop was stolen, my $400 was stolen, my clothes were stolen, everything I owned was stolen. And the leader of, of Chaz, or I guess the second in command, uh, replied to him, dude, we're stronger with you, please don't leave. You don't know that this person didn't need your stuff more than you do. You just made an unplanned donation. And I'm like, if no two words better defined socialism than unplanned donation i mean th th those two words were made to define socialism so it's gonna be interesting to watch well, this play out because go on and one of the strange things is that people are taking their children so laura and claudia laura um, tells you know has been sharing little uh photos that claudia has been taking of the uh of the activities and they're people with their children in strollers now, I'm being very lighthearted about this, but I'm in absolute mortal terror and panic uh, that my little baby girl is in the midst of the inferno. But it's two worlds. There's the daytime world and the nighttime world. And that when it gets dark, she goes home and uh, she has to go to work anyway, so she's not there con continuously. But it's, it's almost like, I, the way I would describe it is reading about the Harlan Renaissance where white socialites would go up to Harlem to the nightclubs mm -hmm. and sort of go slumming and have this exotic experience. That's what my daughter's doing in the 21st century. 
um, and she's doing it in Seattle, Seattle, Washington. What's well, the tale of two zones as well? I mean, there's the daytime zone, the nighttime zone. One is very violent, uh, anti-authoritarian, mob rule. The other is the street fair, um, crazy liberals who come out and don't have jobs. And these were the people who were unemployed at three percent unemployment. You know. <laughs> so it, this sounds like the Episcopal Church. Crazy liberals, authoritarian, mob rule, uh, violence. It sounds like a general convention guy. It does. Um, let's move on. I guess the biggest story of the week, and there's lots. There's probably four big stories. George and I only have time to cover two. This next story we're going to talk about, I'm also doing an interview Monday or Tuesday with uh, Ann and Alan Haley, our lawyer friend. The Diocese of South Carolina, um, the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina, has one big in court. Uh, Judge Dixon, who was uh, appointed to make sense of the five uh, different rulings from the Supreme Court judges that was issued in 2017, has made sense of it. He said, this is what they meant, this is the law, this is what we're going to do about it. And basically, he says, the 36 churches belong to Bishop Lawrence's diocese. Uh, they belong to the Acne Anglican Diocese of Connecticut because we have neutral principles here in South Carolina, and there's nothing the Episcopal Church can do about it that Dennis Clanton doesn't apply. He also said the trademark and the seal that are in dispute can't be decided by the Supreme Court and can't be decided by um, any courts within uh, South Carolina, that's a federal issue. They're granted federally, and they will be um, overseen federally. And, you know, from my perspective, once again, smart judge. You don't find a lot of smart judges, but here's a guy who applied the law, applied reason, applied common sense, uh, and really spent a lot of time going through the material put out by the Supreme Court, which was just a disastrous uh contentious five separate opinion decision put out in 2017 george you're right judge dixon was brought in to enforce the supreme court ruling mm -hmm. that first meant what does it mean now it was contradictory the not all the the judges were all across the board on this and so what and there was no majority decision saying this is what we mean and this is what we want to do it was a very it was outing for the court. So Judge Dixon had to take these disparate views and apply them using the case law, the property deeds. He released his fine he released his order on fr yesterday, Friday, around eight thirty in the morning is when it was time stamped. Now what it said was that the prop the pro the property issue, secular things that can be decided by secular law are going to be decided according to just secular decisions if this were the rv if this were your rv camp association or if this were any other business dispute we'd look at what the contracts say and what the intent of the parties was and everything none of the 36 parishes endorsed in writing or in any way that could be found or shown to have taken place the dennis cannon South Carolina does not allow an outside party to impose trust or an obligation on you unless you agree to it. And therefore, because it's not in writing, it doesn't appear in the title deeds, it never appeared in any documentation just because the National Convention said this. And he didn't even get into not whether or not they could say this or if they did say this. But what but the issue is even let's assuming that it's true and that they have said this and this is what they meant. What does it mean in practical terms according to the law of South Carolina? It means nothing. So the Episcopal Church has no right, title, or interest in the 36 properties. They don't go to ACNA. They don't go to Mark Lawrence's corporate office. The title re remains in who the property deed says it belongs to, which one of the things Mark Lawrence did a long time ago was to grant quit claim deeds, meaning the Diocese of South Carolina says we have no interest in your property. If you own, if you, St. Swithin's Episcopal Church, St. Swithin's Anglican Church, have a title deed to your property, it's yours. Mm -hmm. We can't do anything and we won't do anything. 
Second, he ruled that Camp Christopher, the diocesan uh, managed uh, children's summer camp, big property, valuable property, it is managed according to the will of the trustees, not according to the dictates of the National Episcopal Church. And then he went on to say that the issue, uh, as you said, Kevin, of trademark and tight and tight and seal. Uh, seal, that's a federal issue because, as you say, it's controlled by federal law. Now, that's currently before the uh, Court of Appeals in Richmond, and that's a separate issue. But this is as clear and unambiguous a ruling and it's a pretty high mountain for the episcopal church in south carolina to over to climb now they have already immediately they said they're going to appeal this so it'll go back up the ladder because this was the dorchester uh i think the first circuit court in south carolina in dorchester county now i think uh, Paul, as I say, I think the Episcopal Church knew the writing was on the wall because they've twice attempted to remove this particular judge from the proceedings. And the Supreme Court in South Carolina said, no, we're going to let the judge do his job. The judge has done his job, and he has essentially hold the National Church's arguments under the waterline. Mm-hmm. Well, they can thing. spend money all they want, but I don't, but, and now, what happens if it goes back to the South Carolina Supreme Court, which it will? Will it get the same model ruling? Maybe not, because there are new judges on the court, and the one judge uh, who was a, how should I put it, who acted unprofessionally. She was an active member of the Episcopal Church. Her husband was an activist in the Loyalist National Church Group. She made... You know, she made it clear where she was coming from. She has recused herself after the fact, so she can't hear it anymore. So they're new judges. It'll be heard based upon the uh, the lower court's rather detailed, thoughtful analysis. Now, following the Fort Worth decision, now these two didn't really in, in their, uh didn't really influence each other because South Fort Worth's decision last month. Uh, earlier this month was reached independently of Judge Dixon's decision of yesterday because it's been in the writing for a long time. But we we do see the trajectory that when it really gets down to serious legal analysis, uh, the Episcopal Church is in trouble here. So the long-term question is, do they want to keep throwing good money after ba- after a bad cause? In other words, Alan Haley tells us they've spent almost $300 million nationally in litigation. And the return, if they had won this, well, they'd get $300, $400 million of properties alone in South Carolina that they can't use. So, I mean, they could turn around and sell them back to the people who own them. That's not going to work anymore. That that hope of recouping their losses. So at a certain point, Michael Curry is going to ask himself, do I want to continue hemorrhaging money because the executive council reported that we're going to be having layoffs at 815 because income is down and you know the the solid days of a booming stock market and people having cash are over well and that's that's one of the big things here the deep pocket of trinity wall street you know the commercial business real estate is over for the next 10 years nobody wants to live in manhattan nobody wants to pay those prices and you're seeing companies move out because right now there's no there is no vaccine the the future mm. of covid is bright the future of real estate is not and mm-hmm. so this is where trinity gets their money from renting out all this lease space above ground um if trinity does have the money to pocket this will the episcopal church uh, continue Don't know. well they have tr- other trust funds so there's actually the cash on hand. Mm-hmm. The question is, though, this is not Michael Curry's battle. This is Catherine Jeffrey Shorey's battle, and uh, David Booth Beer is the former presiding bishop's chancellor's battle. Curry's inherited this, and he's inherited an ongoing operation. And so his counsel is, "Well, just see it out, finish it out. Don't give up because we're almost there. We'll, we're one more battle, and we're going to win." Well, they've lost, mm. and. 
the national church has to decide curry has to decide you know curry's big thing is the race issue and he's got some big dreams he wants to accomplish stuff and he's got to ask himself they're finite finite resources at what point am i my own man and lead the church in my own direction versus carrying water for my predecessor's disastrous decisions at what and now this is asking Curry to act like in a business-like, rational manner, and I don't know if that's something bishops do. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, he's in a difficult position because he inherited a role, uh, pretty, you know, pretty much destroyed by the predecessor. So, yeah. uh, would I have to see that where that goes? Now, there's about four or five big stories we should cover. George and I are going to uh, tape again on Tuesday, and we only have time for one more story before. Uh, Mrs. Anglican TV comes out of the bedroom and walks around half naked going, what are you doing? You, I thought we were having a vacation. So Indian what, corruption? Or is oh, that be no. Well, well, it's kind of a saga story. Um, Archbishop uh, George Carey was a previous Archbishop of Canterbury and for all intents and purposes served a wonderful uh, tenure as Archbishop, retired and uh, was making the speaker circuit, was doing uh, officiating at uh, special events around uh, the Church of England and around the world. You had invited him to a special event with your church. And then news here and there starts to break that he may have unwittingly allowed uh, sexual predators uh, to, I can think of, uh, to continue ministry. And the Church of England and councils within the Church of England want to make sure he's a layman now and i thought you could help uh delve the story because i know him met been him many times you consider him a personal friend i want people to know we have a bias already on this not that we didn't have a bias with the last story but we really have a bias with this story too and i we need to to kind of conjure up the story and see how it unfolds but what do we know now little bit of background a few mm. years ago uh the peter ball saga which kevin and i and gavin ashton have discussed extensively on this broadcast over the years peter ball was a charismatic anglo-catholic bishop charismatic in personality anglo-catholic bishop who was a minute who was a monk who was just viewed by people as being just the spirit of aggressive manly forward-thinking Anglo-Catholicism. He's so attractive, and he had the special ministry to young men to help introduce them to the religious life. And he was a charmer, seducer. He was best buddies with Prince Charles. In fact, in his retirement, Prince Charles gave him a house to live in on that Prince Charles owned, one of its properties, uh, without rent. Uh, he was uh, friends of politicians, friends of royalty, friends of wealthy judges and businessmen and army generals and and he was also a pervert. He was a molester of young men. He was a sadomasochist homosexual serial predator. Came out and when it started coming out, George Carey who was then the Archbishop of Canterbury said to Peter Ball who was then a bishop, is any of this true? Peter Ball said, no, it's all a wicked lie. And George Carey believed him and did not do the due diligence that is expected today. He did not do that in the 80s. Okay. So when all of this broke four or five years ago, Carey was roasted over the coals for not having acted properly in uh, following up on the accusations against Peter Ball, which were true. So Carey was disciplined, and for a short period of time, he lost his ability to serve as a retired bishop. It was restored, however, because there was no finding of any guilt. He didn't abuse anybody. He just was fooled by, just as Prince Charles was fooled, and he didn't do what he could have done. It was an act of omission uh, rather than a bad act. Life goes on. George Carey was going to come to our parish at the end of April to help. He was going to be my house guest for a week to sell, and he was going to sell our parish's 25th anniversary. 
And then, the, of course, COVID broke and all that's ended. And Kerry's in his late 80s, so I don't think he's leaving the country any day now. The, now, we have another scandal, this time on the evangelical side of the Church of England's scales. John Smythe. Uh, there's an institution called the Ewan Camps. It was run by the Titus Trust. The Ewan Camps were summer camps where young boys from the top 30 private schools in England, what we would call boarding schools or very nice day schools in an American context, were invited to these evangelical Christian summer camps that had been around since the late 30s, where the counselors were of the same social class and background, and they would basically be inculcated in evangelical Christian virtues. And many of its the alumni of this camp are people who are famous in the Christian world, people like John Stott, oh, the, the fellow who runs uh, uh, the Alpha program, um, Justin Welby, uh, who's who of evangelical Christians came out of this. John Smythe is a QC, meaning a senior level attorney, barrister, uh, who volunteered his time to be a, an adult counselor, an adult mentor at this camp. And then he would invite boys uh, to his house uh, for sort of weekends, for religious gatherings during the school year. And he developed a little cult of sadomasochistic beating of boys that under of uh, the guise of religion, he would beat these boys on the buttocks with a whip to sort of drive the sin out of him. Man, was a pervert. Uh, so that's, enough, that's enough description of, of, <laughs> of This all came out privately within the evangelical upper class world in 82, uh, 1982. And it was, and, and they handled it the way people in that class in that time handled things. They said, you have to leave the country. You have to it step down. Yeah. We're not, we're not going to turn you over to the cops, but we know what you did, and you're not doing it anymore. 83, before uh, John Smythe eventually moves to, South, to Rhodesia, or Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, and then on to South Africa. And he has since died of a heart attack before the police were able to interview him here in the UK. In 83... Smythe is still in the UK, and he start and he attends Trinity College Bristol as a part-time non-degree student. He's an adult man in his forties, fifties, whatever he was. At that time, George Carey was the principal of Trinity College Bristol. Now, Carey is a working-class man. He's from Dagenham in East London. His father was a hospital porter, which is a janitor. This is his first in his family to go to college. Uh, he is not part of the evangelical elite upper class he's in fact the opposite he's he's one of the he did a, from an outsider's perspective Carey did a wonderful job as archbishop of canterbury but he was despised by so many people in the church of england as being somebody who didn't deserve to be in the position that he was in um for class reasons and Nobody told Kerry about the the allegations of Smythe. This is a guy who's on his campus, take one class, maybe one day a week, who he never met personally. And we don't know this for a fact because the Diocese of Oxford has not said what... No, let me... I'm getting ahead of myself. This past week, the National Safeguarding Team that's investigating the whole Smythe affair told the Diocese of Oxford that certain information has arisen regarding George Carey that does not include actual George Carey committing abuse, but it's in connection with the Smythe affair, and we ask the Diocese of Oxford to suspend him once again. So effectively, Carey's a layman. And so the Diocese of Oxford removes his license or his permission to officiate. Carey finds out from the press. And he releases a statement to Channel 4, and, and I, his son sent me the statement too, you know, which they wrote on the fly, which is, we have no idea what this is. We have no idea what they're talking about. George Carey has not, to his knowledge, ever met Smythe. Uh, I mean, 
and he doesn't know where this is coming from, and nobody's telling him anything. Yeah, it, no and trial, the same people who are investigating him, yeah. and the same people who are investigating him have are basically two years late on. They were supposed to do some sort of follow up from the Peter Ball stuff, and he was supposed to be with the Archbishop of Canterbury mm -hmm. and sort of go forward and reconciliation, blah blah blah. That's never been done. Yeah. And now they're hitting him from another angle on something that is, in my opinion, frankly ridiculous. Well, and, and here we are again. The Church of England has a wonderful ability to take sins of the past, generations ago, of dead bishops. Uh, not even a sin at that point. Uh, you remember Bishop, not Ball, but Bell, Bell. George Bell, yeah. George Bell was uh, accused of horrible crimes and uh, with no evidence, no nothing, but uh, Justin Welby made sure that uh, the constables did a full investigation, that uh, everything was conducted, and in the end, nobody found anything. Lord Carlisle got involved, and they just they never found any of these accusations to be true. Here again, they're treating a living archbishop. It, it, yeah, yeah. With Bell, it was more than that. Yeah. It was not only they found no proof of the allegations, but rather the allegations were so incredible they could not be true by their very nature. Yes. It, uh, <laughs> in other words, they were fantastical and they had no real relationship to reality. So it's not that, well, nobody actually saw it, therefore we don't know, but George Bell is accused of being in, you know, being in places and doing things after he died. I know. Uh, and so, in this reality, I think the Church of England has to come up with a different system. If you have evidence, you at least need to have a hearing with the person you're accusing and you're going to uh, decommission, make a lay person. Uh, they don't need to find out through a newspaper, and so they can defend themselves. This is a world where we're allowed to defend ourselves in Western democracies. And all you do is put spear, spearless comments and uh, call up a diocese and says he can't serve anymore because he may have been a dean of a uh, a student who turned out to be a pervert. I mean, we're you guys are still you're still doing it wrong. No, we're speculating. We're speculating oh. because we don't have no the diocese yeah. of Oxford has not said what this is in relationship to and. And Julian Mann, who's written a very nice article for Anglican Inc., says it is most likely that this is it because there's no other there's no other connection that can be possibly thought of. Now uh, that in for Julius Mann, so that that that's where I'm so I'm speculating upon a speculation. Right now, let's be fair. If they have evidence and. Um, it, it seems to be truthful, and it shows that uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, George Carey, did something in error and wrong. We would report that as well. I mean, we're not uh, trying to cover up. We're trying to help get to the bottom of this. Why does the Church of England have this propensity to falsely accuse or overly accuse, um, certainly overly uh, uh, prejudice people for for bishops they, they just don't seem to like i don't know george we and we, I, they do they, if, if i might just add one sure, little yeah, yeah. Point. um they don't don't just do it to bishops martin percy who was a liberal lion in the church of england he's the dean of christ church cathedral christ church college at oxford mm -hmm. he's a leading liberal he was the one who led the charge against philip north becoming the bishop of sheffield because north didn't believe the ordination of women mm -hmm. He, uh, Percy has been involved in a nasty internal college dispute and it's basically something that's not really religion related other than the Percy's a priest and Christ Church is a college and a cathedral but Percy's enemies had friends within the safeguarding team who were able to, to take their dislike of Percy and turn it into a safeguarding complaint against Percy and now Percy is the uh, is uh, like George Carey, the victim of an unknown star chamber proceeding. Uh, whereas we have bishops uh, who are involved in the Smythe affair who've not been uh, 
not been disciplined or not been sanctioned on day one. No, we lose side, yeah. like George Kerry or Martin <laughs> Percy from the right and from the left for the admin current administration. Uh, well, I hate to use these words because they're American political terms, but it's the deep state versus the outsiders, well, it's, it's, whether it, they're on the right or the left. It's more sad than that. It's basically the same mob rule that uh, the zones in Seattle are using uh, to, to run the streets. George, we have hit a whole half hour of wonderful Anglican news. Uh, I do need to cut it short. We have two or three more stories we'll record on Tuesday, uh, the day after your staff meeting, the day after I get back. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And you're watching episode 605 from Hershey, Pennsylvania, <laughs> of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>